If there was a potential adversary, completely hypothetical, and they wanted to target us upstream, what kind of things would they potentially do? Oh boy. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> they might buy a lot of land nearby our bases. Uh, okay. Um, so, do you, have, do you have time for stories here, Flash? Do we have a story time? And ask the simple question of, you know, hey, you work in industrial control systems defense. What would be the worst day of your life? It would likely be a factory that would, a billion dollar project that would supply all the upper Midwest with their animal feed and supply chain. That's, by the way, coming from a Chinese company owned by a former member of the People's Congress of China and right outside of Grand Forks Air Force Base. Like, what do we need? Can we do it? How do we do it? How do I know it worked? And what do I do if it doesn't? Well, how have we overdosed on that? And what impact do, do you, th what impact do you think that it has on potential future conflicts or unintended consequences because the way we fought Af in Afghanistan is not the same way we can fight against an actual nation state. Because the effect that we need may end up being someone from the State Department calls that country and says, hey, we do more trade with you. Stop giving them all this rubber. And you don't even have to tell them that the rubber is being used for the, the front tire on some jet. That, that's the ultimate solution. Everybody, welcome to the pod. We have two uh, incredible guests tonight. Uh, when we talk military war plans or anything that we go out in there and do, the single most complex thing that we do is overall targeting. So when we kind of think about what are we going to do against a pacing adversary or anything like that, we have a lot of schools of thought on how to effectively target a military or target the will of the people or what kind of theory that we are going to elect to go with. And throughout history, we've seen a lot of different uh, organizations and nations uh, kind of go different, different routes with it. And we're going to talk about it all today. It's going to be great. We got Zero Fox and we got Toad Williamson, two of uh, some of the most knowledgeable and professional intel professionals uh, that I've ever gotten the opportunity and pleasure to work with. Uh, I got to be with them at the weapons school for almost four years uh, and still work with them and talk to them uh, to this day. I haven't seen them in a couple in a, in a little while, but uh, this is going to be this is going to be fun. And we're going to dive into all of it. And we might get into some conspiracies as well and touch on some hard hitting topics. So without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce uh, Zero and Toad. Uh, Zero. Uh, 30 seconds, man. Tell us about yourselves, a little bit of background, what you're up to. Oh man, Flash, thank you, brother. It's been, uh, it's been way too long, uh, since we, uh, the 17 alpha, uh, class, we got to hang out together. Um, but, uh, so my background, uh, originally from, uh, central Pennsylvania, uh, married, got three kids, uh, a beautiful wife, Lauren, and, uh, my kids, uh, uh, Calvin, Isabel, and Penelope. Uh, but right now, currently, uh, in the Space Force. That's my, that's my background, transitioned from the Air Force. Uh, but my Air Force career uh, originally started very heavily SIGINT uh, out at Fort Meade, uh, went from there to did some time in Afghanistan, came back, went to Colorado to work a lot of the space stuff. That's where I got my first inclination to uh, space flavoring, if you will, and then went out to Nellis to class with you, Flash, and then had a hardship tour, uh, just a real hardship tour out to Aviano, Italy. Uh, for my tier one assignment and got a chance to work out there with some awesome uh, Viper patches out there. Uh, shout out to uh, Trick Wilson and a few other folks that uh, I got a chance to work with. Came back as an instructor and got handed uh, the orbital warfare portfolio. And uh, upon that, I, I said, I don't, I have no idea what orbital warfare is. And the, everybody said, uh, yeah, neither do we figure it out. And so that was uh, one of the, the great things that I got a chance to work on. Um, Spent a lot of time. That's where I, I really connected with Toad, and I found a kindred spirit in the targeting world. And he and I uh, went deep diving into uh, the Grey Zone Caucus, which we developed ourselves while we were out there, and developed a bunch of other terms we'll probably bring up today that we'll say that like, sound professional, but likely we just made them up, like leaf targeting, upstream targeting, all these different things that are really a colloquial for phrases that were historical arguments from the past, too. Um, and then from there, uh, now I am out in uh, Chantilly, Virginia, working in Northern Virginia, and uh, I love it and hope to retire and die out there, which would be great. Uh, so that's my Perfect. background. Uh, but the real the real genius here is uh, Toad. Oh, yeah, oh, it does. Like I, I was going to say, is like, <laughs> like as we as we go, yes, 
there were a lot of things either both in 17 alpha and when we were at Nellis that we were just like, you know what? I think we're going to coin this term. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be, a be- yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we're going to make when this up. If you're the first one to make a name for something, you're, you've, you've made it official, put it in a white paper, sign a memo and it's over. Yeah. It's already, gonna wanna, now it's gonna, law. You're going to want to start memo. telling other people that other people are saying it and then they start saying it. That's, That's right. right. I've got That's right. And we're going to bump people are later saying too. It. I've gotten yeah, a couple people quickly. to buy in on this. All right, Toad, tell, <laughs> Toad, go go with it, man, and then we'll jump right in. Yeah, so uh, Toad uh, Williamson. So I um, I uh, originally from uh, down around Houston. Um, I came in about 2006. Um, currently, uh, I'm married. I've got two kids, and uh, I have been uh, looking back. Feels like I've been all over the place. But when I when I first came in, all I wanted to do was. Uh, Fighter Intel just wanted to work with F-16s. I grew up in the backyard of the 147th Fighter Wing at Ellington Field, and uh, I just remember looking at those every day following 9/11 and thinking that's what I want to be a part of. Um, but then I ended up going to off it, uh, which well, with the phrase "once you get off it, you never get off it." Luckily for me, I got off it, and after about four years, but I went there and I did no support to flying units. All I did was learn most of the aspects of targeting that we might get into later, things like collateral damage estimates, uh, coordinate generation, um, hard target weaponeering and stuff like that. Um, And then after that, I I did a a couple of deployments um, where I did a lot of that targeting. And then uh, after that, I went to uh, Sunny Sunny Creech and and I hung around there for about four years. Um, Then I actually got to do some flying unit Intel support, but by that point I did it. The Air Force created a new job and it was called being a targeteer. But when I got to that unit, they really only wanted me to do normal Intel work. And so as a targeteer, I did normal Intel work. And then after that, I got to go, I had a hardship of my own. I went out to Hickam in Hawaii, uh, which was just brutal. Um, And uh, I was out in Hawaii for four years, did a lot of planning. I uh, I uh, focused on most, I mean, we've got two problem children out in that AOR and focused a lot on those specifically in dynamic targeting and ISR planning. And then uh, went to weapons school in 2016. And then I was lucky enough to get to go back and teach in 2020, which is when I got to meet meet two, you, you two lovely gentlemen. And uh, and after I wrapped that, the four, I was there for three and a half years. And then uh, now I'm up here in, uh, I'm up here in South Dakota. And uh, yeah, that's me. Well, there you go. Well, there and and Toad being a uh, Nebraska Nebraska man, born and raised, uh, and my dad working at Offit for <laughs> a long fair. time, and now they and now they live in South Dakota. Uh, but mm-hmm. love that place, love Offit. Uh, and that's what we said that we were gonna maybe save some rustic stories for later on. But uh, I will I will tell one right away. Was one of the very first times I got to meet Toad was. Uh, when you guys would just all of a sudden about halfway through the course teach a class on the ISR capabilities of the United States of space. And you would come in and kind of give them a familiarization with all of the things that we utilize to develop targets and things and things of that nature. It's uh, it is the best academic course at the weapon school. And in my opinion uh, we will set the classification level of this of this podcast that unclassified, of course, but uh, some of the things I, I personally think are ISR intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capabilities in the United States and the Department of Defense is actually an offset for us. It's what it's kind of one of the true advantages that I had, I give us uh, is in the ISR realm, in my opinion. Uh, and those courses were great. And I just sat there as an instructor and kind of listened to you guys give that brief. And I was, I was just like, oh, okay, this is, this might go okay. We might we might be fine, guys. We might be all right. So, so loved hearing hearing from those classes, uh, and and just learning from you guys. So this is going to be fun. So kicking it off. All right. So targeting again. So many different theories uh, when we're looking at it. Uh, really, with the kind of the some of the ones that we want to look at is we talk Warden's Five Rings. We talk Duhay. We talk these different guys that uh, historically have given us from the early 1900s all the way even until now our targeting scheme and how we develop war plans and whether like what you decide to target uh so 
what whichever one of you guys wants to go, we're going to jump in uh, a little bit to like Warden's Five Rings and some of the theory. And then we'll also go into what we kind of utilize now for once we decided what theory we're going to use for as far as targeting, uh, how do we actually target and looking into maybe potentially going overboard and overdosing on a little bit of something we like to call find, fix, track, target, engage, and assess. So, uh, so Toad, if you don't mind, man, uh, go ahead and talk to us about Warden uh, if you want. And then Zero, you can hit us with the converse of, of Duhay. Yeah. So, I mean, so when I, when I originally came in and we were, we were starting to learn a little bit, and I know we'll, we'll get to this a little bit more later on, but a, a process called target systems analysis, but basically it is how you look at an adversary based off of a, it can be a broadly defined objective or it can be a narrowly defined tactical task. But from that, you would do a form of analysis called target systems analysis. And the ultimate output of that would be some sort of prioritized list of the exact pinpointed areas that you would need to hit in order to achieve whatever that task or objective was going to be. Um, way back in the day, whenever I came in, I swear the only way that I was taught how to do TSAs was like I understood Warden's Five Rings before I even knew it was a thing because we were essentially being taught these rings that ultimately get you to what a what an adversary nation or adversary state's center of gravity actually is. Um, and so for the for the folks that are listening, essentially, you would work your way in through these rings and the five rings would consist of uh, the first, the most outermost ring would be targets that are affiliated with military, the fielded military forces. Then you have uh, uh, things that uh, contribute to the, the wellness of the population itself, infrastructure, system essentials, and then the actual leadership uh, of that country. And so it, the idea being you would wage war on these progressive rings in order to bring a country either to heal or to to just to formally defeat them. Um, I would say with with what we're oh uh, what's that? No, just and I want to if I can jump on that just a little bit here. So you know, Warden and his background. If we look into that, that's he started. He was a colonel uh, who wrote about this in the eighties and early nineties, and a lot of his theories then. Um, oftentimes get attributed to some of the early takedowns in Gulf War One, And then ultimately, right, his his distinction, right, as, as Toe just mentioned there, is leadership being the, the most central point to that. Like, can you decapitate that? You know, the dichotomy there is like, can you decapitate the leadership? But those are also the same people you need to capitulate to meet your policy proposals, right? So how many of, how much of that do you actually want to apply pressure to? And what ways can you influence them? Um, and then there's there's an interesting I'll, I'll, I'll I didn't mean to jump in there I'll let Toad uh, to finish up on some of the warden discussion, but there's interesting where Warden got some of his thoughts and the distinctions prior to with the Air Corps Tactical School from the 30s, which also drew what what I would call a sine wave, if you will. There's ebbs and flows of people who really prioritize strategic bombing, the idea of bombing beyond the forward line of troops or bombing beyond the edge nodes, right? And those who are obsessed with bombing military field and force targets. I would say I think that we are currently in the 2024 schema, not to be controversial or anything like that, but uh, we are currently oh, in a peak, in a peak of being a preponderance of military fielded force targets as our as the predominance of how we conduct our war planning, and I think that that is a derivative downstream of coin, and we don't even know that we're there right now. But I'll I'll save that for a little bit more further on that. Go ahead, Toad. Sorry. Yeah, and that and that's absolutely correct. And so basically what with the so to use some examples, right? So like if they're a under under the concept of Warden's Five Rings, if I were to um go after um the infrastructure that provides a country with electricity or go after the um water systems, or maybe if I wasn't even gonna do anything that I would say is like that morbid, maybe I'm just going to bomb all of the bridges so that it's harder for them to trade with all of their neighbors that may actually have a greater effect on that country's leadership's willingness to come to the negotiating table or to surrender um, than me just blowing up uh, one or two more surface to air missile sites or me just blowing up a C2 bunker or something like that. Um, and so th those were essentially the theories that we were using to drive targeting, which would explain why um, in, in, the, in the Gulf War, we went after all sorts of infrastructure um, and I, not to like turn the clock back too far, but literally in every major 
conflicts that we have ever been in where air power was a key element. We have bombed targets like uh, like dams and dikes, bridges, places like that, because they were contributing to the overall strength of a nation to wage war on us, um, specifically the Korean War, the Vietnam War, um, and obviously in Iraq. And we, we bombed a ton of bridges in Serbia as recently as the 1990. Um, but so, but the key part of it is that that was a way of thinking about targeting where you would focus our military assets on uh, waging war against a state, whereas now we tend to focus more on how we point our military directly at another country's military and not at the state itself. Yeah, and and that's kind of a, and that's an interesting it's an interesting dynamic because as time has gone on, like when you look at, uh, and we're going to talk about it later, but when you have kind of the theory, the theorists of war, like even when you get into the, like Clausewitz and Sun Tzu and things like, and things like that is you, you almost to win a war and you're de determining what targeting scheme you're going to utilize is you have to almost not separate the civilian and the military is is like pretty much anything that's civil that is military infrastructure probably also has a civilian function as well. And now what are you going to do with that? And how are you going to target? And is that okay? Cause we now have a lot of law that is going to tell us, and then also just public opinion and in 2024 public opinion is huge. Uh, and will the people, which is a little bit of what Duhay was saying is it's like attack the will of the people versus mm -hmm. attack the military field of forces zero go with it. Yeah, no, and, and there's there's two parts to that equation. There's the will of the people and the means of production, right? And I think that the where strategic bombing has in the past always come to a crossroads. The first obstacle is when it gets abused to area bombing of population centers and or you know carpet bombing in in Japan and Tokyo fire bombing at that point. Um, the the whole intent behind a lot of this is when you start to think about. Um, deliberate versus dynamic targeting and how we go after it. But strategic bombing, ultimately, you know, historically it is, it has had these, these uh, inflection points. Obviously world war two was an inflection point for that. The Gulf war one was an inflection point for it. But I think that after 30 plus years of coin, we, how did we win that war? What was the, what was the part of how we did that? It was how many moles can you whack at one time? Right. And a lot of times, and I, and I don't mean to say it like that, but the nodes were individuals. The nodes weren't necessarily the production center. It was the individual that ran the organization. So what that forced our hand at the time was to get very, very good at identifying objects, persons, places, or things that were critical nodes within a, a kind of a terror network or an insurgency network. And that inherently is is dynamic targeting solely. And everybody who is now professional from 06 on down has only ever cut their teeth in that world until we've now come to this idea, which is the strategic bombing place. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll say something else and with regards to, to Warden and with regards to Air, Air Corps Tactical School and Air War Plans Division-1. The US, when they went into World War II, um, daytime precision bombing, it was very much heavily influenced by AX, which I would say had draws probably very early weapons school ties, which I think is kind of interesting. So veterans of World War I all got together, started writing about tactics, and they took Duhay and they filtered Duhay and they said, hey, it is, it is not immoral for us to attack the will of the people by hitting population centers. It is moral for us to be able to attack the means of production by destroying the, the, the critical elements that produce a military effect. Now, those critical elements that produce a military effect, that may be a ball bearing factory, right? That may be a dam. That may be, you know, in this particular, like a, a desalinization plant, potentially. You know, all of these different things are, but what one thing to also note is that our adversaries are quite aware of our dynamic targeting schema and our targeting schema of the last 30 plus years. And they're going to stamp a dual use sticker on even militarized islands. They're going to put dual use on something. And that's going to create, uh, that's going to create, you know, real, put us in knots when it comes down to that. I'll pass it to, I'll pass it to Toad here if any thoughts on that. Well, yeah, I mean, if I, if I know that my adversary is addicted to, to hammering the nail that it's good at hammering, maybe I, maybe I don't need a bunch of amphibs. Maybe I just need to build a bunch of fairies, you know, as an example. And that's um, where, and that's where I would say too, and Warden, <laughs> and Warden differed from Duhay. So Duhay was all about population centers and Warden yeah. was more so. You know, he'd be in the he'd be all for that Soleimani takedown, 
would be a oh, would yeah. be a warden piece, right? Warden would probably be all for the you know the Gaddafi house bombing, um, even though Gaddafi had Im- impeccable drip, as the kids say. Uh, <laughs> That's right. Anyway. That's so right. I'll let, he did yeah. look. He did look good, and he, he, yeah, he, he did honestly. Look good. I I don't I know I haven't I want to know where the guns went, but I also would like to know where his wardrobe went. All right. <laughs> I think we know where the guns went from Libya, but neither here nor there. Okay. And, and I get, I got a question. A for, I, oh yeah. Conspiracy is a letter. I got a I got a question for you guys. Like when you said uh, you, you made a comment in there, it was like the last 30 years of our coin conflict. And it was like, what was going to win that war was again, just the, the people and the individuals that you had to now kind of find and determine what their value was and how critical they were to the terrorist network. And just kind of going that route, I think that plays into where we currently stand uh, when we look at objects-based, uh, like kind of targeting and thing. And oh, yeah. what we're going to talk about here is so one. It's a it's a methodology. Uh, it's become like the accepted uh, methodology in which to determine and how to target things. Uh, and then once we actually like determine that something is going to be targeted. We have to one, find it. We have to fix it, i.e. geolocate it to a good point. Toad talking about coordinate generation and then track it. Like if it moves or things like that, or just battle track it, put it out there somewhere. Uh, Target, find the correct shooter, uh, role establishment. Then we engage, we push, and then we we, we assess. And that's where you kind of get into the five seed questions that we all know and love, hashtag weasel. Uh, But when we say like, what do we need? Can we do it? How do we do it? How do I know it worked? And what do I do if it doesn't? And kind of what the coin thing that you were discussing uh, for the last 30 years, Zero, was how have we overdosed on that? And what oh, impact yeah. do, do you th- what impact do you think that it has on potential future conflicts uh, that are unintended consequences? Because the way we fought Af- in Afghanistan is not the same way we can fight against an actual nation state. So what I'm about to say is heresy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm okay with that um, because I believe you, you the, because I believe Flash, you. have you heard of the new acronym for F2T2EA have you heard it? they just came out with it it's a brand new one you know we used to do PC pad F2T2EA no, people are saying it people F-quad, are saying it people are saying, people are saying I know a colloquial F2T2EA but I'm not sure we can say that for our younger listeners but we can uh, here's the new one uh, the new one is Lith Whiplum it stands yes for, it's L- yes I have yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's L I T H W P L M. I know it's harder to say the whole letters out like F two T two E A, but you can just say Lith Whiplum because what that stands for is least important target, hardest way possible, last minute. And that's least important target, hardest way possible, last minute. All right. Now, uh, okay. Now, I don't mean to be. I'm a little tongue in cheek here with this, and I understand. And I, I want to caveat true. this before I become more provocative and inflammatory with it. There is a place clearly for dynamic targeting. If I got a bunch of bros up there in the air and you need to be able to dynamically target a Sam that's going to threaten your life before you target something, then by all means, smoke it. Like there is, I want as an Intel professional to be able to do the hard thing and find, which is just a categorization of parametrically knowing what the object is, fix, just a function of uh, locating that object to a targetable coordinate, track, do that over a duration of time, and then, um, uh, you know, target, that's, can I put my, point my gun at it, engage, can I engage that target? And then can I tell if I killed it or not at the end? Assess, that's what F2T2EA is. You know, there is obviously a place for that in our military functions, but it is not a strategy. And everywhere no. you look, that is the strategy. The strategy is how can we F2T2EA ourselves to death? And I'm here to say it's an old argument. It's an argument that's been around since we had airplanes. The argument of whether or not, you know, Axe was fighting against this in the 30s and they were fighting against it from the sense that airplanes were used just as the support to the flot, the fielded force targets, forward line of troops to be able to support there. Uh, We've we've looked at it in terms of, you know, what is what is the function of air power? Is it just to be kind of like the Blitzkrieg element or is it actually to then reach in out and touch critical nodes that we target? So people probably are like, okay, all right, bro, why are you connecting F2T2EA to strategic bombing? How are those things distinct or different. Well, I think it's all kind of in the camp of, you know, deliberate versus dynamic targeting one, but we have gotten uh, high on our own supply. We are addicted to the ability to be able to 
try to parametrically identify each and every unique individual object and then say, can I put a bomb on that in record time? Can I set a new Jamaican bobsled record to hit something? Now, let me, let me just, I'll, I'll frame it in this way. I'll use the term object-based production. And for those who don't know what object-based production is, you'd mentioned it earlier, Flash. Object-based production isn't, is, is literally a, a way of thinking to categorically bin data. And what do I mean by that? Object is a noun, right? Person, place, or thing. Can I visualize as an Intel professional that noun somewhere in the in the fight, right? Visualize that noun and then apply Intel data to it. Can I tell where it is at a specific time and visualize it? Can I do that in real time? You know, it's hard to for Intel professionals today that might be listening to this or anybody else, like we've kind of spoiled, like we're used to being able to do that with a lot of different military objects. But the hilarious part to that is like, do you think we were doing that like with grease pens or before computers? No, there was, we had to understand how systems of systems work. We couldn't parametrically dive down to say that specific tank, that specific plane, that specific ship has these specific characteristics. And oh, by the way, you know, let's dog walk this thing all the way to wherever we want to find it, right? What, what I think has happened is we've become victims of our own success. We have, based off of how big our collection apparatus is, it is no longer a question of do we have the data, it is a question of how do we synthesize the copious amounts of data that we have. And in doing so, we have then told all of our Intel professionals, your job is to be categorizers. Your job is to be literally um, Dewey Decimal System librarians to categorize Intel data into specific objects. Now, I, as an Intel professional, spend most of my time or will spend most of my time at some point in my career, most likely, just trying to stare at a particular functional military component and make sure that I know where it is, what it is, and where it's going, right? That's it. What would be more beneficial is if I could look up the stream from that military component and say, what are the vulnerable spots to get that thing to where it is, that ship, that tank, that plane? What are the vulnerable spots upstream and their supply chain that are easier targets to kill that are far more reachable to hit? That is strategic bombing in a nutshell. And this is how object-based production and F2T2EA OD, overdose, or Lith Whiffle, least important target, hardest way possible, last minute, has become a strategy instead of a, a function, right? It is just dynamic yes. targeting. It is not a thing that we need to, uh, it is not a thing that we need to build our entire game plan around. It should not be. And if it is, you're going to lose. Sorry, over here. I, I, I'm all freaked out. Now. No, I, yeah, I just want to <laughs> add, I just want to add a couple of things. Uh, so like, most people are going to be familiar with this, but what I would say is like during coin, we obviously, we got super good at the thing that we needed to do, which is exactly what Zero was talking about. We got really good at F2T2 ea individuals over and over again. But the majority of our targets, there's categories, right? So you have your dynamic targets and then you have your deliberate targets, but then you also have this gray area where we're gonna do something dynamically, but we're gonna plan it deliberately and we'll, we'll call them those deliberate on-call type targets. But we're not really doing deliberate. We're just like, hey, OC, guys, here's the order OC, that the OC, pickup game OC is going to go. Six, baby. Yeah. <laughs> like whenever the whistle blows, here's what you're going to do dynamically. But it's deliberate because we thought about this a little bit before you were going to go do it because we just don't know the time and the place. Um, so we got really good at deliberate on call and we got really good at dynamic. Um, that, <laughs> but however, what if an adversary has every conceivable numerical advantage on us and just mass produces cheap stuff. And uh, we are not like you take away that thing that you think is very important. Well, they have a thousand more of them back there. Um, so it, you're turning into now this thing that we got really, really good at. And it's like, hey, look at me. I can do all these awesome little kick flips with all of my systems and I can pull off all these F2T2 EA tricks. The adversaries like, hey, I'm, I'm really not happy that you did that. However, I've got 500 more of these things left. And so we're taking the thing that we were really good at, and then we're now it's running up against great power competition, which is countries, and countries are going to have the ability to mass produce things um, probably faster, I would, I would contend, than we may be able to mass produce some of the munitions that we're throwing at these things, uh, well, depending on which country it is. But, um, but then I would also say one other thing, just to pile on with what, what Zero was talking about. 
if you guys see a, a Sam or anything like that out there, you guys got to you're, you're going to have the ability to go ahead and kill that. One thing that I do want to talk about with this, which is like this is my this is my dream as an Intel person. This is the perfect mission that I would like to support. It's it's I don't think that it's dead, but nobody uses the term anymore. But SCAR, I remember back when I was a student, I, I was the lead for a SCAR vault. And that was my favorite vault because I was just there helping everybody plan. And then you guys just go rage and let me know how it goes. But like, I don't need to be, I, I don't need to look for ways that I can become your DFP. Like <laughs> yeah. go and, go and yeah. rage and then come back and let's talk about it. Well, I think the way that if you look at a lot of the past wars that we fought that were against large states, a lot of the, the taskings were not ATO taskings. They were MTO taskings. And so you would basically be, you would, you would get some MTO type task. And for that, that would be mission type orders, not air task orders. And instead of it being like, you go to this spot at this time with this weapon and drop this weapon on this exact point, and then let us know how it goes. It would be go to this area and a trip, this type of thing by 25% over the next 72 hours. I have to do analysis now because I've got to, I've got to help prep you guys for what that looks like. Um, if I'm told to trit this airfield's operations by 75% in 72 hours, now I have to do a miniature TSA so that when you guys are like overhead and maybe you have bombs to dump on the way back, you can look down at that airfield and be like, Toad said okay. the POL tanks were going to really screw them up. I better not drop them on the runway because that's dumb and nobody likes who anyone who drops bombs on runway. Please don't do that ever. Um, but <laughs> MTO, MTO, that's just a that's just a personal jihad but they're just going to put steel grates over it nobody cares uh so but there's those Recruit. types of taskings yeah and so but also though like if you go up to most <laughs> air force personnel and you say mto they don't even know what that means because we literally never did it throughout the course of the last 20 years and now we're ultimately for you guys to have the flexibility that you guys need in order to to do what you need. I, I mean, you, you look at every other time we fought a nation state, it, we had to fight a lot of it that way. We're not going to be able to micromanage every single JDPI that you guys put bombs on. I, and, it, that's, and that's, that's the thing too, is like the way we, and the way we fought is like Zero's talking about the amount of data that we had and everyone just got so enamored with the data. And so now it became a thing where we're talking about um, anybody that's a target engagement authority or anybody like the person who has the target engagement authority is like, where's my full motion video? Like, I want to be able to see this thing. And that also has become a problem with F2T2 EAOD as well. Uh, and last minute makes it last minute and it makes it least important. Uh, but yeah. And the way we target delivered on call dynamic and all these different things, utilizing F2T2 EA once like zero said, that is a very tactical thought process. I'd say it's, in the moment right now, but like as far as strategic, if you want to go out there and again, touch all five rings or destroy the will of the people or destroy the means of production, you're going to have to do some different things. And and two things to that mm -hmm. flash, and, and this is something also that Toad had mentioned up with regards to magazine depth too, but you know, the F2T2EA in and of itself is a forcing function and object-based productions are forcing functions for military fielded force being your only target. Right. At most of the times. Right. Yes, there's some probably static, but they're also the military field force targets that you zoom into when you when you do that. Now uh, you, you end up putting yourself in a position where, like, are we risking the things that we can't replace against things that they can, you know, at a, a very high replenishing rate, especially when you're fighting an away game. Right. If you have to fight an away game, it is it is a much different. Uh, set of consequences here. Like we could get into, you know, the the actual logistics, the contested logistics of that. The fact that we've actually never been in a contested logistics conflict since the Wolfpack Nazi subs, like, really, had has not been a thing. DLA hasn't yeah. existed. Defense Logistics Agency didn't exist in a time when we ever had to have contested logistics. And boy, oh boy, does it show. Um, so the <laughs> not to throw any spears, <clears throat> but there is a famous first spear of the day. Quote, first one, first spear of the day. Um, there is a famous Sun Tzu quote that I really like that I wanted to use here. And it, it, this is from Sun Tzu. It's probably like, you know, circa a couple of you know, hundred BC or something like that. He said, it is better to look cool, spend resources 
and perform tactical trick shots in the hardest way possible than <laughs> analyze your adversary's soft spots and judicially strike upstream. And that's from Sun Tzu, probably. Um, yeah, <laughs> but I don't know. I think I, I, I think that. I read that. I think I read that in the. It's a weird translation uh, version. Uh, but people it's don't there. understand translations these days. It's just different. Yeah, it's so in, no. <laughs> it's in there. So, but so but yeah. So with you go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Oh, oh no, so I, I, like it, so with that is like, how would you guys? Oh, great, 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 uh, great point. How would you um, target? Well, so I think we could call F two T two EA targeting kill chain targeting, and we've often said like complete the kill chain, all that kind of stuff, right? I am a big fan mm-hmm. of supply chain targeting is far greater than kill chain targeting. Um, there is a great product that Toad actually was able to generate recently using ChatGPT, which was kind of awesome. Uh, it's called an Ishikawa diagram. It's a diagram uh, made popular uh, by Toyota, actually, a uh, car manufacturing company, which essentially starts at one end state of like Toyota Tundra at the end and has uh, what looks like a school of fish or like dead fish bones off to the left of the Ishikawa diagram that breaks out all the different components, materials, the critical elements that feed into essentially make that end state point. You know, I am not sitting here going to say that there's certain Chinese military equipment, pieces of equipment that need to, you know, I didn't mean to say Chinese, but we know whomever, whomever our pacing threat is. Um, Yes. There's not pieces of equipment that we need to take down. All right, we'll just quit the facade. Yeah. You know, there's pieces of equipment that we may need to take out. Um, But let's work back and see what those soft spots are. What are those critical elements? What parts of the supply chain can you do? What are the things in the periphery? Uh, Lytle Hart called it the strategic indirect which essentially talked about the point of of being able to, you know, why would you ever fly into the fly into the maw of the dragon's mouth in like the part where he wants you to fly into where he's the most defended. There are objects, states, locations, functional areas. There are um, mineral extractions, areas that we can target. And in different ways we can target too. It doesn't always have to be warheads on foreheads. It could be something a little bit different there. So I would go supply chain targeting is greater than kill chain targeting. And I think that there are a lot of old lessons to learn from that, you know, and there's pre balloon goes up, post balloon goes up thinking, but transport plan of 1943, Pelosi, even the Indian wars, right? Korea, like there's different examples of supply chain targeting being the effective measure that actually ended the war versus any military fielded force, you know, masturbatory exercise over you, Toad. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, so I think uh, what how how what I would recommend it would be some sort of uh, modernization of Warden's Five Rings, built around this acronym. Lots of people are saying it. I keep hearing it everywhere, but people are calling it Leaf, which is uh, logistics, energy, agriculture, and finance. People are saying. Uh, so they are say- they're saying. Uh, but another way. Of, so if you, three of them are right yeah. here. Yeah. This is yeah. So uh, so there's Leaf. Which is also you could say, and I would say I've heard it commonly referred to as upstream targeting, but you're looking at logistics, agriculture, uh, um, energy, and financial targets that are upstream from military fielded forces. So it's kind of a twist on Warden's Five Rings. But essentially, each one of those elements of LEAF, whether it ends up being a supply chain or not, those are things that are upstream of the fielded forces. Therefore, they're going to have cas- cascading effects down the chain, and they're also likely to be less defended. And so you're doing uh, uh, some sort of a strategic effect in an indirect way that will have a cascading effect on the forces that are actively trying to kill you. And so one way, so to to actually tie this in a little bit with what Zero was talking about. So if you were to um, and also, I, I, I'll, I'll caveat this. I really hope I didn't teach Chat GPT something horrible, but I was screwing around <laughs> with Chat GPT last week, so to speak, and I may or may not have stumbled onto something that's alarming. But so let's just say, like, <laughs> hypothetically, we were going to try to build like the, Ichi, the Ishikawa diagram would be what we would use to facilitate the TSA for these types of targets. So if we were to say, hey, um, name an aircraft. There's different components within the aircraft. There's the avionics. Um, there's the actual training of the pilots. Where do the pilots sleep? That's kind of messed up. But if you were to break out like the tires on the aircraft, we'll just say we'll go with that for example. So let's say this aircraft requires a special kind of rubber for its tires, or the tires have to be made at a special manufacturing plant because they're a certain size. 
Well, now if I, I ID that plant, um, there, there's, there are instances, I'm not going to get into it, but like whole fleets of types of combat coated aircraft have been grounded because the specific tire that they needed just ran out of inventory. You could ground an aircraft by going after its tire. Uh, if you identified that as a critical node that, that didn't have a lot of depth, you could go all the way down to like the, the rubber, uh, uh, to the to wherever the rubber is manufactured in some other country that maybe they imported it from, and you could actually have effects on that that could disrupt and induce delays. And uh, so, and and also to get at what, what Zero was saying, like I could trace that back to some other country, and I may not. Here's the other part: this this has to be holistic. But right now, we're not even really necessarily identifying. Well, I won't even go there. But we <laughs> we have to be able to identify those nodes and be able to identify the effect that disruption of that node would have on the fielded forces before we can even talk about the effect that we're going to try to get on the node. Because the effect that we need may end up being someone from the State Department calls that country and says, hey, we do more trade with you. Stop yes. giving them all this yes. rubber. And you don't even have to tell them that the rubber is being used for the, the front tire on some jet. That That's the ultimate solution. And then you isolate them. But if they don't want to listen, then maybe maybe then you go to other options. But if you can't quantify and identify that that is a link that their military depends on um, and tie that to targeting, we have a lot of smart people in our country that read and and uh, they do all sorts of crazy things. They write too. I, I just started that sentence out, so I had to finish it. They read it and write. Just as they read and write. <laughs> they, they are, they're, they're literate. But our, in our IC, we have so many smart people that are subject matter experts in lots of things, but a lot of those folks are not also experts in targeting or the targeting process. So that like nugget of knowledge probably lives somewhere in some behind some gray office door with a nondescript like label on the outside of it, but that person isn't talking to somebody that could put a bomb on that. But, and let me and let me also say things something about that part two toad. I don't think the experts are in the DoD, right? I don't think the people that are to go after these logistics, energy, agriculture, and finance targets. I think you have to reach outside of government, and even reach into commercial to do that. And this is not. Yeah. And people think that that's a dirty word, but there's something to be said about. And people might may make the claim like, oh, well, we've got organizations that actually do this. Well, yes, that's true. But those organizations have been doing coin for thirty years too. Right. The people who have an understanding of how to fight a nation state and how to fight what I would call like the industrial web theory stuff that was being built by Air War Plans Division Dash One in the 30s and 40s that talked about doing all those things. Who did they go to? You know, they didn't ask the Army Air Corps or the Navy what to do. They went to J.P. Morgan and they went to uh, Ford and they went to some of these other industrial places and said, how do I make the worst day of your life happen? And they said, oh, yeah, this is how you'd break it. Because I think that the general theory of this in industrialized nations, nation state fighting, right? You know, there are uh, the nature of the enemy can be different, right? But the, the actual things that like society is built on, the infrastructure size, the logical layers for those things, like there's a lot of similarities there. And there's a lot of, you know, in Intel, we always say you don't want a mirror image. You don't want to pretend and not, that's not what I'm saying. There are certain people that understand how things work, right? I'm, you know, I am the son of, 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 blue collar people who work in worlds of, you know, as electricians and truck drivers and things like that, who understand how logistics and the grid and all these different things work. And that's uniform regardless of the country that you're in, right? Yes. There are, there are certain ways that that works. And I think that to ask then, and this is the other side on the targeting component. One of the reasons that we go after military field and force targets is because that's what we understand. And by the time it takes to get an airman, a sailor or a soldier trained up to understand how an oil refinery works to be able to hurt it, right? To blow it up, put a warhead in this component, not that component, or even just like put a whatever non-kinetic effect on that thing. By the time they have that expertise, they have PCS, right? Or they didn't even get to that level in the first place, right? They got to the novice level. So if you really, we, we pay lip service so much to this, the term whole of government approach. And every time I'm in a room where we talk about the whole of government approach, the only people in the government that are there are the DOD. <laughs> right. Yes. Like, and even if we did bring in ag, energy, all the other components, right. Hate to say it. Like they're still government workers too, man. Like they need to bring out, um, they need to bring out all the people like from the commercial entities that are good at some of this stuff and start to 
apply pressure to them because a lot of them know targeting too. There is a healthy contingent of you know economic hitmen that exist out there that know how where to target in logistics, where to target in the energy sector, where to target in the ag sector and the finance sector. And I think that one thing I'll, I'll touch upon before you see if you guys think about that is just like there's historical precedent for this too. We did this before where we reached into uh, components of industry to understand how an adversary, how to break an adversary. But yeah, yes. that's, that's kind of my thinking. And, on. and the, and kind of the, the interconnectedness of the current world is a, is a massive deterrent. And so when you're leaning on some of these different or what some would call non-standard, um, non-standard fields of targeting, like upstream, uh, if you will, uh, or, uh, the very, very important acronym of LEAF, uh, just doing LEAF targeting. Uh, as we're, as we're kind of looking at that, it's just like you do, you have to think outside the container. And when we understand that when we, when we look at is going to war with a nation state is bad for everybody. Yes. But when you want to understand, like, what are people doing to either prevent war or to set it up in advance? then now we can we can one harden ourselves and then two have a better a more strategic and either more lethal or actually potentially less lethal but more impactful targeting scheme so now the, a previous conversation that you and i that you and i kind of had we had um we had joe weiss as a as a guest that just was recently yes. uh recently posted and he's talking about some of the things uh, that we have seen. And when you talk about whole of government, but then only the DOD is present is we're blind and we have blind spots. And so if there was a potential adversary uh, out there, completely hypothetical or anything like that, and they wanted to, and they wanted to target us upstream, what kind of things would they potentially do? Would they start to (laughs) potentially, I don't know, like look at some of our logistics, i.e. fuel uh, or anything like that. And, is there anything open source or out there that's just been in the news that has occurred recently? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they might buy a lot of land nearby our bases. I don't know. Uh, okay. Um, so do you have, do you have time for stories here, flash? Do we have a story time. We got, we got time. <laughs> um, so Toad and I have been working on this project for a while, right? To, to, Essentially, in the within the weapon school, start to look at you know what are distinct, different types of targets we can look at offensively, but also, and this is just as as, as a thought experiment to elevate. Hey, there are there are some things here with which, and one thing I'll hit hit upon here real quick too is, just because we are picking targets differently, doesn't mean that we are in actually increasing you know bloodshed or anything like that. Actually, no. the intent of this is for a greater deterrent. At a lower yes. cost, and so that our, you know, red-blooded Americans aren't essentially throwing pink bodies at a multiple fielded force problem, that we are judicious based off of being responsible for our magazine depth, responsible for um, everything else, like for, for responsible for our fuel loads, responsible for all those different things. You know, that is that is part of it as well. So that's just kind of one thing I want to frame first. But let's talk. Um, Toad and I uh, initially were out at the weapons school and we wanted to write a paper on what it means to do leaf targeting, logistics, energy, agriculture, finance targeting, um, and why we thought that F2, F2T2EA may be Heard of it. You know, a way that maybe we may have overdosed on that. We need to think more deliberately about what we select because we don't have the munitions to be able to support a you know, wild, wild west, whack as many moles as you can all over the Pacific kind of thing. So for us, um, uh, we ended up calling out cold calling people of industry, right? We called people that, you know, some of them obviously are attached to the government, but a lot of people that we could talk to and ask the simple question of, you know, hey, you work in, um, you know, industrial control systems defense, what would be the worst day of your life? And they were able to articulate that obviously in an unclass setting, but it was essentially for us to understand it. For me, I'm not an expert on anything that isn't a military target. I'm barely an expert on military targets. So I was asking, like, hey, how do I break industrial control systems? What is an industrial control system? How is that, you know, that's essentially managing, like, the the central nervous system of a factory or whatever, however you want to look at it. Um, you know, no kidding. We were we were calling people in the oil sector, the uh, energy, obviously the energy sector, the agricultural sector was huge. And then logistics and energy and freight forwarding sectors. Like, there's a lot to learn from how goods move in the United States that we have, you know, the world's best Navy to protect the world's worst commercial shipping fleet, which is 
kind of incredible when you think about it. Um, the this led to getting a tip off essentially that there was an a, a Chinese land purchase near a DoD installation, Grand Forks Air Force Base, um, and circa 2021, um, I, I had gotten tipped off essentially that this was the case that they were uh, there was 300 acres being bought around Grand Forks and it was going to be used um, to build an industrial superstructure. I, AKA a wet corn mill facility. Wet corn mill facility, for lack of a better term, is animal feed uh, production facility that uses, you know, millions of bushels of corn, burns them at a high rate, and then is able to break that down into, you know, animal feed. It would likely be a factory that would, a billion dollar project that would supply all the upper Midwest with their animal feed and supply chain. And that's, by the way, coming from a Chinese company owned by a former member of the People's Congress of China. And right outside of Grand Forks Air Force Base, um, I had there were a lot of I, I won't get into too many of the details. People can like look it up if they want to Google it. Grand Forks Air Force Base uh, land purchase details. Um, but I ended up uh, writing a memo, essentially not making accusations because a spade hadn't been put in the ground yet to actually build that factory. But I uh, wrote a memo that essentially said like, hey, there is a vulnerability here based off of the things that we have at Grand Forks, which is open source. People can look at that's where we do a lot of testing. We've got the RQ4 up there. We test a lot of things. There's the Grand Sky facility that's at Grand Forks. It's not a good idea to have a 300 industrial acre and 300 acre industrial superstructure full of antennas and God knows what else um, right outside of the Air Force Base. And there's a national security risk to that because it would bring in hundreds of Chinese nationals that would work. These guys are related to the People's Republic of China, like they're they're there coming from that. The CEO of the company at the time had 30 bio fermentation, bioweapons patents in the country. Uh, this is all open source. You can look all that up. And oh, by the way, when they did that, they ended up, um, you know, obfuscating a lot of the paperwork to try and get around the Committee for Foreign Investment for the United States or CFIUS. Um, and that was kind of a red flag. It's like putting yourself outside. Oh, and by the way, one of the biggest red flags was when cold calling Cargill and a couple other uh, facilities, uh, they essentially stated that there is no way to make a wet corn mill facility at the northern tip of the frozen tundra and the frozen corn belt actually functional and profitable in that spot. Um, so there's a lot of details that go into this story uh, to include, you know, some really interesting and shady deals that were going taking place locally there. Um but suffice it to say that that project ended up getting shut down because the 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 memo that was pushed up through Air Force change and leadership essentially got them worried enough about it. But it, let me be honest, 100 percent, Toad can attest to this as well. It took a Rube Goldberg of consecutive miracles to, to even make that happen. Um, and there's a lot of people involved, the local townspeople, a lot of commercial people trying to essentially stop uh, what would have been. A, I think a, a vulnerable project and and for lack of a better term, not saying that it's an Intel collection facility, right? I'm not even making that claim. Um, no. Do you really want your upper Midwest animal feed and supply chain controlled by uh, a country that you're growing hostilities towards or there's growing adversarial tensions towards whether that dissipates or not. And it may dissipate in 10 years. Who knows? I hope it does. But I hope it does too. But in the, in the near term, um, not a good idea. And people should, be aware of it that it's happening um and that's not that's one one win of a thousand losses um and there's so many different ways that with which our system is uh that that china knows our system better than we do like circumnavigating cifius is is one of the easiest things to do in the world um and it's there's plenty of loopholes that are actively um talked about and the loopholes that aren't talked about are are the ones that you know you have there is not uh, a usual case where the foreign entity isn't represented by an ex CFIUS attorney. That's just a standard, uh, which is a which is uh, which is a huge problem because they'll they'll pay more money to get that representation. Yeah, yeah. and arguably, Sorry, and I, arguably, I kind of like, digress. No, there no, and that that's weird story. No, and that's and that's fine because it's like it's again where we look to potentially target. We have to understand what other what our adversaries might want to do to us, and when we say when we say that. Um, knocking furiously on wood, we have learned over time that our geographic place in the in the world 
is very generally safe. It's like obviously right. long range, long range weapons and thing and things like that. But the United States is very difficult to hit militarily. It is like very difficult to get here. And we've done a lot of things uh, in the realm of defense uh, to keep it that way. So now when you look at it, as you say, OK, so how do we impact the United States in the event that we would ever want to have a conflict with them is when we can't hit their homeland. It's like, well, we just become a little bit of a part of their homeland. And if right. you if you just become yeah. part of everyday life, then you can hit at the will of the people and the leadership. Uh, so when you look at like the third and the inner ring of Warden's Five Rings is you can hit them pretty hard, pretty fast, which is why we argue that we should be targeting that way as well. Toad, go ahead. You, have, you, are, you got yeah. it. It's not like, and, and you're kind of quoting them themselves, right? They wrote about doing it exactly this way yes. in uh, Unrestricted Warfare, written in 1998 by the, they call them the two colonels, right? They talk about our, um, what I would call hubris. I would call it hubris with uh, both our acquisition cycle um, you know, there's there's a, a quote in here that I wanted to uh, kind of expound upon for targeting. But it, like, are we a uh, acquisitions driven targeting cycle or a targeting driven acquisition cycle? Right. And and this same question was asked. The only reason Air War Plans Division was stood up in the 30s was because Roosevelt and those guys at the time told them, hey, I want to know how many bombers I need to build. So before I just go willy nilly and build a shit ton of bombers. I want to know what the targets are and what I would actually go after first, right? So it was actually targeting-driven acquisitions as opposed to acquisitions-driven targeting. And that targeting-driven acquisitions, what's what's very interesting about that, and this kind of plays into the asymmetric threat vectors, what I would say exists within the United States, whether it be farmland purchases or bulk fuel storage purchases, which is also pretty interesting, um, whether it be either of those things. You know, Air War Plans Division got their information because, one— they took majors and lieutenant colonels that were training at the ACSC in Nazi Germany at the time, which is kind of interesting. So they brought those guys back after they trained at German universities to say, how are the Germans viewing the world? And then two, they went to uh, different financial institutions uh, within the United States that essentially subsidized the building of German manufacturing products. So JP Morgan and all the different banks of the United States helped build the German war machine. That's, that's a known fact. And so the Air War Plans Division guys called up JP Morgan and said, hey, we know you funded this. Give us the blueprints based off the loan you got for these guys. Now, let's flip that on its head a little bit. Let's invert that. We had U.S. people in the school of the adversary that we were about to go to. And then we had financial ties to that sector. If you want to talk about a particular country, right, there are 300,000 Chinese nationals that are going to U.S. universities now, predominantly in STEM fields. Not saying they're all bad, not making that claim, but I don't think it's necessarily a good idea to have them in the material science facilities or working out at MIT or working out at Stanford or working out of all these other academic institutions. We always talk about, you know, intellectual property theft. And I also think it's an interesting play to note that, like, there's a lot of U.S. debt that's subsidized by uh, China at that time. There's a lot of financial tie-ins to one another, you know, and maybe those things are, maybe those things are actually helpful for not going, you know, I have a, I have a nine-year-old son. I don't want him to get drafted in nine years to go fight in China. I really don't want that to happen whatsoever. I'm, you know, that's not something I want at all. Um, if I'm not willing to send my son, I shouldn't be willing to tell anybody else to do it. Um, but the, you know, the other side of that too, is to think that th there's, there's lessons, like you said, like if we're not penetrable with a missile necessarily in our country uh, at that level, where are we soft? And there's a lot of spots that and some of those spots are givens. And some of those spots are, you know, we could patch it up just a little bit with a little bit of effort. I'll pass it to yeah. I'm talking too much. Yeah. So one of the one of the key things with that is like when you say where are we vulnerable and where uh, I guess what, what is it that we would need to defend? One of the things that was very interesting, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna dig into specifics or anything like that, but I will just say that they don't have to exploit a major vulnerability. All that was all that would be necessary for them to duplicate what they may or may not have been trying to do in Grand Forks in any other town in the United States. All that's really necessary is some compromisable city council members is really all it takes. 
for them to be able to come in with a large sum of money or some sort of investment, sell it as this is going to be great for your town. Hey, let's take some trips here or there and look at how great all this stuff is. All it really takes is a couple of people with flexible uh, morals or people that are given a financial incentive at the city council level to be able to purchase or build facilities like this that are right next to our basins. So it's really uh, un until it becomes like illegal for them to make those sorts of purchases, that becomes the only thing that's really necessary for them to arrange that sort of a deal. Um, yeah. And it's really hard to defend against that without legislating it. Um, but uh, on top of that, one thing that I do want to highlight, because Zero was talking about acquisitions and what drives acquisition. Um, earlier, whenever we were talking about uh, the types of munitions, or we were talking about how we do targeting and dynamic targeting and a lot of that stuff. If you think about, um, there are, like, for the most part, the way that we have done acquisitions for a while without a uh, large adversary, uh, like at post-Cold War, I would say, without a large adversary, the way that we have been developing things is, hey, I need to increase capability from this platform in a new version of it that is much better. I need to get better in all directions. I need you to take this and get it here, but maybe it's better in two or three other things. Whereas some of our other adversaries and some of the stuff that Zero is talking about, um, when they're developing things, they say, I need to build five things that can destroy this specific facility. And then they build them to accomplish that. And now they also have redundant effects on a specific objective while we are building things that aren't built for a specific job or a specific target set. And that's not to say that we've never done that. That's not to say that we didn't like literally build specific aircraft just to go hunt down very tall men uh, uh, or, or man that was hiding out somewhere. Like we can do things when we want very quickly that's just generally not the case with most of our acquisitions. We're typically trying to take the old thing that we had and put it on steroids without it being focused or aligned with a specific tactical task. Um, yeah, it's like, we, and that's and just AWP, not how a lot of other militaries do it. And they're, AWPD one kind of, kind of discuss like a like hundred thousand, like when you build a hundred thousand airplanes and say, I need to, this is how many airplanes I need to do. But that, that hundred thousand airplanes wasn't just, I need to build a hundred thousand airplanes. It was, I need the capability to hit these types of targets with this many things. And the most correct way to do that was build 100,000 airplanes. And so when you go at it from that perspective is a more strategic based line of thinking uh, versus yeah. just building a plat building a singular platform and saying, hey, everything, everything is hunky dory, which of course, the F-35 is that platform. So, like, we should uh, have that. <laughs> yeah, that, that's uh, the one. We don't have, we don't, yeah. we don't have to t dance around it, you know. But like, yeah. and I, I, I think it's idea. great. I'm, I'm a big fan. Yeah, I, she's sick. Panther, good. Panther. Um, um, so I, I wanted to go back. Hey, yeah. One of the things that <laughs> Flash just said there. Flash said earlier. So Flash, kind of like, how would you guys do it? Because I, I, we were like, I, I feel like we were kind of tap dancing around it. There's five things that I would, we could fix tomorrow you know, with the right, the things that we would, how I approach it. So I would, I think step one would be the repurposement, uh, repurposing of uh, certain National Guard intel units into dedicated LEAF logistics, energy, agriculture, finance, upstream targeting shops. It wouldn't yes. take that many people to do it, but I nope. would make it National Guard. And the reason you do National Guard is because it is the entity that one, both has consistency in the target set. So you have uh, folks that'll be in that guard unit for 15 plus years, right? So I can develop expertise. I get rid of the PCS problem. I get a, a personnel base that is generally one foot in commercial and one foot outside of commercial. So if I were interested in a whole of government approach about, and I'm not saying agricultural targets aren't necessarily blowing up cornfields. I'm talking about, hey, why would we apply effects into, say, parts of South America to disrupt certain agricultural flows for XYZ country? You know, that is something I would maybe give to the National Guard unit in Iowa, right? Somebody who understands the agricultural sector. If I'm going for, you know, uh, energy sector, maybe that's a National Guard unit in Texas. The idea is that there are certain uh, units that are already currently existing that get after this somewhat, but let's just go whole hog and look at this and say, there are certain National Guard shops that are now shut down or are looking for mission because it's a post-coin world and they were just doing ped for coin for a while. 
repurpose some of those guys into upstream targeting shops and start to get back to the world where not everything is a dynamic target. We have to hit the least important target hardest way possible last minute. There are some things that are going to be deliberate targets and there are soft spots for particular adversaries we need to focus on and get good at again because those skills atrophy over time. That's step one. National Guard units dedicated to LEAF that you would reallocate at that time. I would then say I would develop internships for both uniform personnel and civilian personnel to cross flop into sectors. So what that means is I would spend a three-year exchange program where I could bring in an ag sector guy from the Department of Agriculture into my Intel targeting shop, or I would send an Intel guy to go work at the Department of Agriculture, or to actually go work at Cargill, or to go work at you know any one of those entities. I'd send someone to go work for Exxon for three years to understand how Exxon and oil refining works, and vice versa, bring some Exxon people into us. Now, there are some, you know, obviously hiccups for commercial companies that are international that want to work or be associated with the DOD. Totally understand that. All I'm trying to say is we need to, like right now, our expertise level for any of these infrastructure targets is the people who do know this stuff exist and they're really good at it, but they are either retired, about to retire, or they're dead because they did it during the Cold War and now they were young then. And now we haven't had to practice it because of coined for 30 years. So the internship program essentially cross flow into the commercial sector. How do I get commercial sector guys into helping the DOD understand targeting? How do I get targeting guys into the commercial sector to understand the nuances of that world? I would then look at uh, current on the shelf AI tools that exist today to help look for critical nodes. There's AI tools that look at blue maintenance, blue inventory, blue vulnerability assessments. Okay, if we can do that for blue, there are certain things we can look at for red. I would then, this is the one of the like foot stompy ones. We practice the fight all the time. Like our exercises are always the fight, but we do not practice contested port to port or port to fight. And we pick bad targets. So what no, I mean we, by that is oh, we don't, don't, even give me, we don't, don't even often get me practice the, the tyranny <laughs> of distance or how we're going to get the materials to the fight. So Flash, like as a football player, you played football at the academy. You're still looking jacked, by the way. I put on, <laughs> have you heard of the fre- Flash? You've heard of the freshman 15? Yes. <laughs> you heard the freshman 15? Yeah, I put on like the, you know, I put on like the 0550. I need to like, my, my brother wrote me the other day and he goes, you're going to be one of those fat 05s or whatever. You need to knock that off. And I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll knock it off. Sorry. Yes, yeah, so I got I got some working out to do. Um, you bet you're lucky this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But as a football player, right, you, you wouldn't run as your first play out of the line of scrimmage. Like the uh, you know the reverse double double reverse annexation of Puerto Rico flea flicker, right out of the right out of the gate right if you hadn't practiced it and you especially wouldn't do it if you only had nine of eleven players, and what I mean yeah. by that is like I don't know it's the oop to you. Most, most of the time when I see how we're gonna you know how, how how we practice our fight like all the pieces are already on the chessboard, right? They're oh yeah like the the chessboard's already set up. It's set up as if it's like, okay, guys, snapshot in time. And I get it. Like, that's the sexy, hard synchronization of effects thing. But, like, you know better than I do. Like, how often do we practice fort to port and port to fight? It's not well, it's, often. And that's and a huge we, lift. And, and and that's the thing. It's like we 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 are – the way America fights wars is a, as, a, as an away game, just like you talked about. And so – it's going to be difficult. It's going to be a logistical nightmare. And when we, me and rain have talked about it before where a present or future fight, which we'll get into in the last little bit is going to look different than any, any other fight that we've ever, we've ever been in. And so, right, right. especially when now how interconnected everything is and things can get just shut down very, very quickly. And when we just white card, uh, and by white card, I mean, it's just like we say, okay, that assumption has been made. Uh, it's things we do in the military exercises sometimes. It's like that assumption has been made. And just like you're saying, it's like all the chess pieces are already on the board. Well, guys, the most difficult portion of this fight is getting the chess pieces on the board. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it's like, so we have to <laughs> exercise that. And that's going to be the most difficult part. And we do it in very piecemeal thing, piecemeal ways, uh, but we never actually get the entire thing. One, because it's hard, because it's expensive, and because it's provocative and exclamatory. Is if you actually, yeah, yeah. and you can't do, and you can't, and that's and that's the thing. Is it's like so you have that's to walk a, a fine line. Is it's like if you actually just, I mean, 
how do you how do you get the chess piece on the board? You put a lot of things into a theater. That's and right. you start like forward deploying fuel and you're just like, well, what's the uh, indications? How are they going to view that? How are they going to view that? And like, so you're going to get, the the, you'll like, get Able yeah. Archer 2.0. Able Archer. This is such, when, uh... it's such a difficult thing, but. <laughs> well, and the, totally the other thing too, ahead. right, is, oh, I'm sorry, but like what, what, this is something that uh, I understand and I'm not throwing a spear at it. I get it. But whenever I was in an AOC, I had to run around and explain to people all the time, especially Intel people, because our feel feels can get hurt really quickly when we're like, I keep saying this thing and no one will listen to my 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 story. Right. But if we're, <laughs> if it's like, why do we keep doing it this way? Well, like literally telling them, hey, for m most exercises, I, I'll say a lot of exercises. I don't know if it's most, but a lot. Most of them that I've ever been in. The target audience is not operational and down. It's for people to step through decision making that they may be encountered with in the real world. So it's like a it's a command level exercise. And therefore, you start to remove a lot of these uh, bits of realism like what you guys are talking about, um, because they're not necessarily the decision points that somebody else wants to be able to step through. So you end up with something that operationally and lower is fairly scripted um, yes. because the target audience is somebody's decision-making abilities and not necessarily the people that are going to be running those plays. But then the other part too is when you're running through that and you have specific decision points that you want to step through, if that doesn't make it into the conversation and you maybe don't like surprises or don't want to... <laughs> You don't want to step through a horror show like that, uh, then it's just not going to get included. And so and, that, and sometimes, yeah, and so, sometimes problems are too big to even address them, right? We have to, and that's that's the part that I, my, my one point there, and one hundred percent agree, Flash and Toad on, on all that. But like, yeah, you, it's easy to say, like, well, just practice contested logistics. Well, then the moment you start moving, you you know, moving now. You don't move it to the target area. You'd move it some uh, some equal distance, or at least say the fuel guy crunch the numbers and say, you know, do we have what's our bulk fuel storage load look like, and are we white carding a lot of this actually in our real world? So, like my biggest fear, and as I'm trying, we're digging. Toad and I are digging into this often, is that um, that there are some assumptions on on just you know we've already talked about like munitions and, and magazine depth, but there's a lot of assumptions on on fuel load. Right. There's a lot of assumptions that we have done in the past to where, you know, we have an asterisk next to our pre-war ready reserve requirement, which per DOD manual and regulation says we have to have, you know, X number of you know, JP8 or whatever, like near the fight or however we'd want to do it. And the asterisk said, we'll use commercial resources. OK, that doesn't work in this kind of fight. It doesn't work at all. Not that they wouldn't even supply it, but there's certain elements of where, you know, this is open source information. 40% of the, the Filipino grid is owned by Chinese hedge funds, right? They own the area with which the ball fuel is stored, you know, and that's, yes, that's kind of quit. That, that, that's concerning, right? It's concerning yeah. to think that there are spots with which on the globe where we hadn't had to worry about that before, though. We haven't had to worry about. I think Intel needs to start thinking of things like an insurance adjuster and understanding that at the end of the day, when some crap breaks, where do I put the check to? Who ultimately owns certain facilities, certain things, especially in that area? Because I think we're dealing with uh, we're we're dealing with essentially um, a, a world that is very very multipolar in that sense, very multipolar. And my last, like probably most controversial plug, and this goes into Toad's incredible uh, writings uh, that he's been doing. I don't know if you wanted to plug those at all, Toad. Is, uh, uh, if you want to win, gonna, the, if you want to win, if you want to win in the Pacific, you want to win in the West or the East or however you want to, you know, the Pacific, uh, you have to win uh, in the South. I'm a huge South America stand, and uh, I think there's a lot of layups down there, and that's that kind of goes to some of our, you know, protecting not just protecting internal conus United States, but how do we protect our hemisphere? Um, the ghost of James Monroe. Yeah, there it is. That's right. <laughs> yeah and with and with that that and that's a that's a great segue we're coming towards the kind of coming towards the end toad please do uh toad has a lot of uh of writing of good writings that i am now getting uh getting data on and, and looking at myself one tell us about them and then 
when we have just made this, made this huge shift in focus towards a pacing adversary, yeah, you have the Russia-Ukraine conflict that we're uh, by proxy uh, aiding and, th- and things like that. But when we've done this massive shift towards the um, Indo-Pacific theater, where does that create blind spots for us? And where are like some, some of these things that we're, that we're kind of looking at as far as what they're potentially doing, or just, I mean, obviously that's can open up a whole can of worms, but when we look at it, it's just like, what is an individual focus on it? It's like very specific in the possibility of a future fight. How does that cloud people's judgment as far as just like seeing, like missing the trees for the forest, if you will. Yeah. So I, uh, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll start off with, I, I, I got this, I have this humble thing. I was just trying, it's a small, it's a small thing. It's called layman geopolitics, but I just started doing it to try to try to stay sharp and get better at writing. Um, but uh, uh, I've started to just kind of use it like a little idea lab. And there's some stuff in there where I, um, what I would say is I, I try to not focus on the main thing. It's actually <laughs> I guess the overall idea of it is like very similar to the leaf thing in general is it's very indirect areas that might be um, an area that could have an effect on a potential future adversary um, or areas where maybe we're not paying attention to or like the general public isn't paying much attention to. I generally I try to focus most of my time on those places uh, for a couple of reasons. One of them is that those are those are honestly areas where I can fully deconflict most of the time um, anything that I might be doing during the day with the stuff that I'm just interested in outside of work. But a lot of it ends up being focusing on, I would say, where Russia and China are taking actions around the world that are not in their immediate backyard. And so most of that ends up being very Africa focused and very South America focused. Related to China, there was an idea that I was tinkering with, and I, I had written a post. It's got a cheesy, lame name, but it's called How to Drain Your I Dragon. Dig it. Um, I dig it. My, my kids are huge fans of it. Um, but with How to Drain Your Dragon, the idea was how could I – there's a there's a concept in international relations that's called uh, bait and bleed or bloodletting. And typically, as the United States for the last – 50, 60 years, we end up a lot of times being on the receiving end of that, which is where there's a there's a spot in the world that may be very important to the United States economy, but but maybe isn't obvious uh, to a lot of Americans why it's important. And then we go and we throw a whole lot of forces into that area, and then we get our find ourselves into a prolonged conflict, bleeding out resources, bleeding out national treasure uh, in that area. Which I've seen this which, one. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. I, you can think of a lot of examples. Uh, I would say we did it to the Soviets in Afghanistan. It was done to us in Vietnam. We kind of did it to ourselves with a lot of coin. Um, but you find these these areas where you you have the ability to take a global competitor and diminish their relative power to you by getting them on some sort of side quest. And so with the how to drain your dragon concept, what that basically was, was it was a map. I took a couple of maps of like, so China, first things first, right? China is the most import dependent country on earth. You've got 20 to 25% of the world population, but you only have like 9% of uh, air, of fresh water, 6% of arable soil, roughly. And most of that fresh water isn't even fit for human contact, much less to be used for farming. Like, it's a disaster whenever it comes to them having the resources that they need to satisfy the massive population that they have. And so if you just take a look at where are their, what are some of the key resources that their war machine might need? And just as an easy one, oil. Every major military in the world needs oil. So if you were to just look at where are the main countries that China gets oil from, and then if you were to overlay that map, with a map of where there is the greatest amount of instability in the world, you start to see some areas where they import a lot of things from places that are highly unstable. That ends up being a very risky node in their global supply chain, which could be something down the road that could feed some sort of leaf uh, uh, target deck or something like that. 
And that doesn't necessarily mean things need to break. It could mean somebody, so specifically, I was messing with ChatGPT on Angola last week. Angola gives China 10% of their uh, petroleum imports annually. Um, somebody in Angola just gets tapped on the shoulder and it's like, hey, could you not, you know, could you not do that? Um, but so with that, uh, with that concept, and then I think, I know, I, and I don't want to be rambling here, but um, You're not. with, with what zero, stuff. this so, is incredibly interesting. So with that, my idea was I, I made one thing and I outlined the concept. Here's how we could potentially identify prospects for a bait and bleed or a bloodletting type thing, which means it, it doesn't necessarily have to be. It could be something that you create that puts China on a side quest. Hey, you, you want to be the global empire? This is a part of the global empire gate. You're going to have to go and have frivolous conflicts to secure supply chains. We know all about it, right? Welcome so to the big league. How do, how do I put Welcome them the on that leagues. game and make them addicted to that video game just like we have been? So, <laughs> um, so there's that. But then the other thing is these are also critical notes. So these are things that you would want to hold at risk in the event of a conflict anyway. And so you need to identify these notes. So the thing and, that I did, what's that? And I'll touch one thing on that toad too. These are not, these are in areas where the, the ROI is high and the cost is low, right? The cost that's is the key way thing. lower. Yeah. And so major, than SES yeah. and ECS. major strategic impact and they are relatively undefended if defended at all. Um, China doesn't have a port in the Atlantic yet that they're putting warships in. So basically anything they want to screw around with on the on the Atlantic coast of Africa or South America, relatively undefended. Um, just uh, yeah, that one's free. Going. That one's free. So, um, yeah. There, so anyway, so there's the concept. Right. And then we get into, OK, now let's actually go and like explore, try to build out an Ishikawa diagram country by country. There's a couple of countries that dropped that popped out right away, one of which. I think somebody else might have just had the same great idea, but I would just say Peru is being handled. I don't know exactly what's going on there, but I know that they have flipped very quickly, and so have Chile in the last few months uh, away from Chinese influence. There was a lot of ports that China owned that they're starting to boot them yeah. out of. Argentina, obviously, has done the same thing. They just have a rock star that's doing it, so it gets attention. Um, but Angola is an example, and so... <laughs> what I did, and I'm a little afraid of this, but this could be something that relates to using AI tools to lessen the analytical workload or expertise workload, is I just go into ChatGPT and uh, just bored, and I say, hey, are you, you ever heard of Angola? You know, I, you got to you gotta build up to it. You can't just flirt with ChatGPT. ChatGPT, right so. you up? Yeah. Hey, <laughs> you familiar? You hang around there? So, and then it gives me 500 words. Yes, Angola is a country in this region, whatever. I say, cool. What are the 10 most critical infrastructure nodes within Angola that relate to international trade? 30 seconds later, it spits them out. And I had been researching this and almost all 10 were things that I had just identified. For example, there's one called the Lobito uh, Corridor, and that is Lobito not libido. Very careful with that. Um, but that is a actual competing corridor that the U.S. and Chinese interests are are kind of, uh, uh, we're in a little bit of a cage match about that corridor. It identified a key port and it identified some other things, some rail lines. Okay, so are any of these critical nodes owned by Chinese uh, government-backed corporations? Less than 30 seconds tells me who owns each one of them, and almost every single one of them was owned or built by a Chinese uh, enterprise that's affiliated with the CCP. So then, okay, so how many of these are actually um, co-located with or involved in this 10% of Chinese oil imports? And then it made that list. And then I said, what I regions yes. of... Ang yeah, yeah. And then it said, what... Well, what yeah, mo almost all of them. Yeah. And then I said, what regions of Angola are these nodes within? And then it went region by region and told me specific locations to include like for the oil. It was telling me specific oil rigs that are in the Gulf of Guinea uh, that, that were specifically Chinese owned or affiliated that were going to a specific refinery by name. And then they were immediately getting shipped over there. And then just 
to see, I said, are you familiar with an Ishikawa diagram? Of course, it says yes. So then I say, can you take all of that data and just put it into an Ishikawa diagram? Didn't even try to church it up. And it literally produced it. And it, it, and it made up effects. I didn't ask it to do that. So it literally was like Chinese Angola ties is like the head of the fish. And then it broke out nodes. And then it identified and wrote out effects that disruption of each of those nodes would have on that tree. And one, one thing to note about this. <laughs> Flash. I didn't ask like, for that. My my brain just <laughs> melted. My brain melted hardcore yes. there. Is that you can make that a living diagram. And that's important because oftentimes when we create a TSA, we create a TSA and it takes so long to build some of that out that it's OBE by the time that it actually hits the printing press. Mm -hmm. But now if you had a living diagram that's interactive, right? or say different data streams that could feed into there that's even more than just open source data, which is what Toad uh, explored with. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's a whole new ball game and how to, how to look at it. And I think that, that those target areas that how to drain your dragon, the periphery, strategic indirect, light all hearts kind of stuff, like all of that, um, that's, we should be looking at things with hard, hard ROI, high ROI and uh, very low cost. And the lift of with which one very, very savvy. Now, granted, like there's only like one toad I've ever known in my entire life. And he's, he's right. It's there. He's incredible. Right. How do we clone? We could either do two things. We could clone toad or we could try to implement these processes. Yeah. So, but here's the, but here's the, here's the key thing, right? So like that related to a lot of the targeting discussion that we had. That starts that whole like train of thought and getting to that point. That starts with a an uh, that is fueled by an objective that like for the start of that it was it was how do I make them go on side quest and spill resources? But I could easily also say how do I uh, how do I uh, how do I how do I uh, how do I have an impact on their imports that pass through the Strait of Malacca. That's a like massive strategic objective that I could also step back and probably find these exact same things. Now, when we're talking about TSAs and what, what Zero just said about how them taking six to nine months, maybe even longer, um, and by the time they're done, it's cool. It's a reference resource, but it's also mostly out of date. Um, those are also being written after a for the most part a task is already narrowly defined they're not that open-ended they're not like this uh, objective that allows us to think outside of the box of a lot of these more traditional areas so they're they're still written to allow us to play to our strengths um so that we end up with this nice cool product and and i love tsa's like one of my dream jobs would just be i could just sit down and manage a tsa team and just nerd yeah. out just look at some notes, right? <laughs> but but it uh, but it takes a long time. You, your flag behind you might let you do oh, that too. Potentially. I don't know. So that's a fictitious company. It's not real. Uh, so <laughs> but uh it could become real. It could become real. It could it could. And in the event that it did, uh, just a just a sweeping disclaimer, Article One, Section Eight, Clause Eleven of the United States Constitution allows for Letters of mark and reprisal, which is the justification for private privateers, <laughs> i.e., private military contractors that could just say, you know, there's a perfect business opportunity right now. They could be going around uh, um, the South China Sea dealing with uh, Chinese maritime militia. If somebody, and we we don't even have to get creative with the name. We don't even have to get creative with the name. I know he went with Blackwater, but like Blue Water, you know, Brown Water. Yeah. Uh, brown red, brown red, red, a good one. It doesn't even matter. Yeah. So, but yeah. So, um, yeah. So, I, anyway, I focus on things like that for the most part with, yeah. with what I write. And I try to output things that are like that. Um, but a lot of my focus is like lately on other little things here and there, like around South America. So, perfect. We could have an uncomfortably long conversation about Guyana and Venezuela, but that that's not. That's like well, another little area that's like, oh, no one else is paying attention to this. I'm going to stare at it and pretend like. We're going to put like layman, 
Layman Geo Paul the link uh, <laughs> in the com- in the comments everybody. of this of, of this and. <laughs> It's great. So, all right, we're going to wrap, we're going to wrap it up here. So in just a couple of minutes, it's like, so where's this going guys? Like in the next, in the next couple of years, we got maybe a couple of minutes left uh, of useful consciousness time for our listeners. Uh, But this has been an incredibly interesting chat and we've, we've toyed around with the idea of doing an Intel and conspiracy bro chat. It's cemented. It's cemented. We're going to do it. Hey, so, we're, uh, anytime I, I am not very busy and, uh, yeah, anytime <laughs> Toad and I, Toad and I can riff. Oh yeah. But, uh, and we've also, uh, for those who listen to us on Afterburn is we've been toying around with the idea of live streaming, uh, some stuff and, and kind of going from there with, uh, people being able to weigh in on their thoughts and, and interact oh, with boy. us as well. So it might be a thing. All right. So, so the, so what, so when we look at like kind of predictions, or anything like that, obviously at the, at the unclass level and open source and thing and, and what's going on out there is I stress that the three of us have military background as like, but at the same time, none of us want to fight a war. None of us want to go to war. Like that is, in fact, the whole purpose, in my opinion, of me being a fighter pilot is, is a deterrent. Like I, I play a part in deterrence. And so when we look at it is <clears throat> you don't want to fight a war of attrition with any nation state is the fact that th- this, that these things are intermingling, like co-mingling, like with our, with our bringing it back to the very start is a Chinese hedge fund that then is now so commingled with our special interests and in industry and logistics and things uh, like that, that now reach out and just like Toad was saying, might have some connection to any uh, political leaders or elected officials or anything like that. That that is something that is touching our inner ring of our leadership kind of, kind of like that. Does that, does that prevent war? Does that deter war? Or does that bring us a little bit more closer to actual conflict in your guys' opinion? I I think it brings us closer to conflict because it, it, it promotes a distrust in the institutions with which, we're there's supposed to be a social contract with, right? Yes. If, if I if I think that the cosmopolitans of DC have a greater kinship with the cosmopolitans of Beijing than their fellow countrymen, then ultimately we've already lost. So that's my that's a that's a Christopher Lash style quote. He used Tokyo at the time, but I'm going to say Beijing. But at that point, that's the that's the revolt of the elites. At that point, um, so yeah, I think that it's actually closer to bring us to it because that in, intermingleness is just going to create. Eventually, the people, um, you know, who who elevate their leaders will have enough of that intermingling at some point. And there's going to be a reprisal for that. You, you, um, you know, Toad and I have often talked about this ethically and morally sometimes on like the idea of, you know, as the as the strike that we're facing now, because we took a ticket at some point as a country. And Toad can explain this far more better than I can. But like, did we took a ticket at one point as a country that that essentially said like, hey, we really want some cheap goods and we want to be able to build that at this rate. And we have to ask ourselves this question now, ultimately, and let's just call it brass tacks. There's so many different variables and so many different reasons that go into it. But at the end of the day, like, I don't think the Taiwanese are some like microelectronics bagger vance that can show up and the only ones in the world that know how to build chips. And if someone who wants to feed me that argument, like, well, it's for the chips, bro. If we lose the chips, we're in problem. I'm going to say, dude, that's bullshit. Like bullshit. Like it's much easier to figure out how to do something like that than it would be to lose a generation in, a, in an awful conflict. Like by 2032, my son's 18 years old and draftable. Uh, I'd much rather think of that from a time period of like, let's figure out how to build the chips by then, man. Like would love to yeah. do that. Um, Personal opinion, not speaking on behalf of anybody, probably gonna get me in trouble yeah. for saying that. That's just how I it's feel okay. about it. Um, but Toad, uh, I don't know, like how what your thoughts on that, like the intermingled interconnectedness of that, and taking the ticket. Yeah, so I, I think with the ticket thing, that's just like if you take a, I think it's a it's a it's a micro thing that I would apply to life, but I think it applies in the macro for a lot of countries as well. But like if you these little things that you start doing for convenience or taking the short route on and there's no perceived immediate cost, like there is a cost at some point. Um, and so you down the road, you start uh, getting 
you know, to, I, I don't, I don't want to make like a drug analogy, but like we're, if you told, if you told a lot of Americans right now, um, you could have, you could, we could totally get rid of all of this stress of, of conflict in this area or that area. Um, but everything you buy is going to cost 25% more. I don't know that most Americans, they may say they want to do that, but they may actually not be prepared to do that. Um, but that's because we've, we've, we took that ticket and for whatever those circumstances were, and, and I, I, it was perfectly justified to open up to China. It was different circumstances. It was to crush the Soviet Union. Um, that wasn't inherently wrong at the time. No. However, we did turn the spigot on that built this monster that we're now competing with. And uh, we, and, and it's now it's nurtured actually a good amount of dependency in the other direction on our side of things. Um, but what I would say beyond that is when it comes to the economics aspect, I can see both sides of it. But one thing that I would say is it, that is very interesting is so depending depending on who you read uh, and which resource, it's uh, I'll just use the South China Sea as an example. It's anywhere from I've seen places that said three to five. The high end that I saw was seven, but you know somewhere between. And I realize that's like more than a 100% increase. I went to Texas public school. Like that's decent math for me, but like three to $7 trillion worth of annual trade flows through the South China Sea. Um, and an equally large, if not larger amount flows through the East China Sea. And any of that trade that goes through the South China Sea on its way to Japan, uh, uh, Shanghai, Beijing, any of those places, it's passing through two places, the Luzon Strait or the, or the Taiwan Strait. That is all, I think that that is one major economic factor that makes it, even, even if the Chinese don't care, they still have to fight through all of that in a decently safe way in order to achieve their goals. Like the massive amount of traffic that's in those areas by itself that would be disrupted, I think does discourage hostilities. Um, but yeah, but I, the whole interdependency part of it is is where it gets tricky because it turns into who there's a you know let me I'll, let me make a quick analogy real quick with the with the Chinese maybe this is a poor analogy every every country doesn't view this kind of thing in the same way we view trade and 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 on on its face we view trade as a, an indication of partnership. And it's like a it's a it's a good thing. And in its exchange and over time, there was actually a lot of Americans that thought that over time, the Chinese were going to slowly uh, uh, become um, they would liberalize because of their interactions with the United States, whatever it came to trade. And, and in some However, ways, they kind of have in some. Ways. Yeah, in, in some ways, in some of the it's actually they've they have done a lot of what the uh, what the. Uh, what the what 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 happened with Japan in the 1800s, where they took a lot of the best bits of information from all of their future adversaries and used it to turn into a, to a monster themselves. But with the Chinese, everything that they have that connects them with another country, when it comes to their worldview, they are a lot of times doing things out of necessity. But mm -hmm. they are also viewing them; they have a secondary function, and that function being leverage. And so, one example. They have, I said it before, they have a massive water problem. One way that they did something out of necessity is they built tons and tons of dams on the Mekong River, on the Chinese side of the Mekong River, um, to, because they needed water. Those dams also give them electricity. They needed electricity. Everything sounds great, right? Well, now, every time they have a dispute, either with um, Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, um, I'm, I'm probably forgetting a, a country or two, but every time they have a dispute with a country that's in that is downstream from them, they leverage that water and they will literally make a drought worse or they will make shut a flood season worse. Yeah, they'll shut it off. And so they or did this out off. of necessity. Exactly. And then they but then they will flip it into leverage. And so it, generally speaking, I would say closer economic ties would would build. Uh, a, a tighter relationship and make conflict less likely. But with the Chinese, I think there's always that idea floating in the background that like whatever you, you, you've got to think about that influence as future leverage that they would also have. And so they may see that interconnectedness as actually a strength that they could utilize 
to encourage something like that. So, and that's not to that's say that like great example that yeah, yeah. and that's not to I'm not and, and I'm just saying like I can see it one way or the other. But like you said before, like I would ultimately rather I would ultimately rather none of it happen. And to not I don't want to get on a soapbox here real quick, but like we I have I have talked about a lot of things that I've gotten a lot of like very peculiar. I would say very, I would say, uh, I have had folks upset with me before that are targeteers because of some of these, these ideas that I have case in point, you bring up targeting a dam in front of a room of targeteers. Some of them might like physically become ill and, and they may puke right in front of you. You don't know. I mean, they might, but, but, it, but that, but what, but what that comes from soft, is soft. so what I want to, the caveat that I want to have with that is just that. I have talked about a lot of stuff here that may seem uh, cruel or inhumane, or these are targets that are not going to be great or anything like that. The caveat with that is I would just say me as like, personally, most of my career in targeting was spent working on things like collateral damage estimates in countries where, so we have, (laughs) this is going to sound morbid, but we have this thing in, uh, I would say, in the biz, in the CDE biz, that is called a non-combatant casualty value or an NCV. And every country has a different NCV, but that's basically the acceptable amount of non-combatants that you can kill in a strike. All of GWAT, that number was one or it was zero. There are other countries in the world, and this is the morbid aspect of it, there are other places in the world where that number is in the thousands. So, like, in a messed up way, we're kind of saying that, like, one Afghan equals, like, 5,000 of these other people, but but whatever. But the main thing I'm saying is I have spent a lot of time going out of my way and putting a lot of effort into the avoiding of collateral damage. And I don't 100%. look at these target sets lightly whatsoever. Well, we talked we talked um, about it in a previous we talked about it in a previous podcast is like is like what was the end state of Afghanistan was it was like our targeting was you couldn't target one individual and then create seven more targets. And so yeah. like, if you, if you, if you messed up the collateral damage in the NCV in that conflict, then you were going to be there forever. But, yeah. <laughs> but now if you, well, if you look at it and you, and you talk about it, you just go, anytime we start talking about nuclear options. That's right. Is that's, that's right. Is that's when we, that's when we well, kind of go, that's when we kind of go, but yeah. Well, and what it, what it comes, what it ultimately comes down to, in my opinion is, um, and I'll, and I'll, I will get on a soapbox about just war tradition, but that's not for this. But what I would say is what is, I'll use, I'll use Libya as an example real quick. And so if you, we have done a lot of these things where it's like this tit for tat proportionality and all this stuff. And then you end up with, let's say a conflict. I would say what is more preferable from a humanitarian standpoint, a conflict that is the violence is at like a seven out of 10. But then that violence ends the conflict in 21 days or a conflict where the violence is like a three out of 10, but it goes on for 15 years. You have dramatically prolonged human suffering on an order of magnitude that that shorter, more violent conflict would not have done. And you can look at Libya today as a perfect example of that. And so looking at a lot of these things, they may on the surface or right away, they may look uh, they may look awful. But if it if it if it hastens the end of a conflict and the restoration of order, they may actually be the more humanitarian options. At the point. And in, absolutely, and in one of... way is just to bring it all the way back to strategic bombing and the stuff we talked about in the beginning of this pod, right? They may be some of the targets that we have to hit because the magazine depth and options we have to hit the other ones just aren't there. Isn't, we have to be exist. more judicious and more impactful with the ROI of the targets that we go after. Because say we go after the current strategy, right? The F2T2EAOD, let's whip them, right? You are going to, all right, can you fight that war for longer than a month at an away game? Can you fight that war for, you know, two weeks? But sometimes there's other things that uh, you also, when you go head to head with somebody and that head to head incurs a lot of losses on your end, that also sends a message too about the prolonging of the conflict. But if you hit the Absolutely. periphery and the periphery is a more layup target at a lower cost. And let's be honest, this pacing threat we have is a pacing threat on their home turf, but reach yes. is still an issue. 
And as a boxer analogy, they want to clench the United States. We want to reach and punch at distance. But if we fight their game, that's a big problem. And that's that's kind and of my piece on that. And attacking on the periphery, just hopefully, uh, like we kind of talked about, just collapses the circle in on itself. And hundred percent is like when you have the when you have the ROA. Well, or ROI. Well, guys, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. This was an incredibly interesting chat, and we're gonna we're gonna do it again. Uh, we are gonna have yeah. that Intel Bro chat. It's gonna be a beautiful thing. Uh, but we'll go ahead and we'll put the comment, uh, put the uh, Toad's Layman Geopolitics. If anybody wants to read that, if you have a link for it, we'll put that in the comments. It'll be it'll be great because it is it is interesting stuff. And and that's another one where people in uniform and out of uniform just expand your knowledge base on what the impacts of some of these things are, because then if you find yourself involved in these kind of conversations, you can just take your game outside of just your your F-35 pilot platform, uh, for instance, and you can kind of get there. And that's why I like talking to you guys so much. So Zero Toad, thanks so much. Uh, you guys have the last word. Uh, but uh, if you guys like this, again, put some stuff in the comments. Uh, follow us on Instagram. Follow us on Facebook. Uh, hit the subscribe button on YouTube uh, and wherever you get your podcast. But uh, Zero Toad, uh, parting shots, send it. Go first, Toad. <laughs> I don't have many, and I'm just honored, man. It was awesome, awesome to chat with you again, and uh, it's it's always fun to to chat about these things. I'm honestly just uh, just just thrilled to be on here and chatting with everyone, dude. It's fun. Thank, thanks again. Toad is the greatest uh, targeteer and in intel geopolitical analyst I've ever worked with. Flash <laughs> is the greatest mission planner I've ever worked with uh, <laughs> ever in the history. He may be humble, all that humble stuff, and like whatever. But I'm just gonna get inside his OODA loop here real quick and just say like this guy, yeah, would, would go to war with him any day of the week. It'd be actually kind well, of fun, I think. So uh, that'd be the well, only thing that I don't want to go to war, but like, it'd be super fun to do with you guys. <laughs> that'd be kind of legit. I just want to go to war to a, with a nice place, like the Caribbean or something. Let's go somewhere. Yeah, that'll be, that's nicer. what we need. That's what we need. Dude. I'll mission plan. Yeah. I'll mission plan that war. I will say yes, that was, Guyana. that was the, th Let's that was the thing. It was Guyana. like, yeah. it was like, is a uh, mission planning mission planning cells with uh, with Toad and Zero got got to be incredibly fun. I appreciate. I, I think appreciate Fiji's getting words. a little uppity. We need to get out there and deploy to Fiji. Those guys <laughs> I, are just, I don't disagree. Mm. Awesome, mm. <laughs> guys. If by the way, if there's anybody from Fiji that listens to our podcast, that was not in no way a threat. Uh, no, <laughs> we, no, we, we actually we, like your country. No, we want to go there. No, no, no. yeah. <laughs> so, all right, well, you guys, uh, again, thank you for those words. I appreciate that. Uh, getting long in the tooth and gray hair on things, some of these things. So uh, I might still have some mission planning game. I think I might, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but all right, I'll say, I'll say this uh, guys to the rustics, man, to the rustics. Let's so do it. as, as always, uh, thanks. Thanks guys. Uh, and we will talk to you later on. Thanks for listening.